It is a wonderful honor to welcome Neil Seaman on this podcast. He is the CEO of the publishing house Sutherland House Experts, and he's an author, researcher, and teacher at the University of Toronto. Uh, and we're here to discuss his uh, wonderful column in the National Post. It is titled Time Tested Wisdom from Leo Strauss on the Persecution of Jews. Neil, Happy New Year. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and Happy New Year to you and your guests. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we met at a rather unusual but quite fortunate uh, set of circumstances. You emailed me uh, uh, once. Uh, I think you were on the list of the people who listen to my podcast and you introduced yourself and you said you're a fan of Leo Strauss and so am I. So that's how we got to meet. I'm a I'm a late fan to Leo Strauss. I don't know about you. I I've only really discovered how important his ideas have been in my own, own life in the last few years, um, especially as intermediated between other thinkers whom I've I've admired. I in my own way, I I went through life and people always had such strong opinions of Leo Strauss. And I was always quite taken aback by those who critiqued him, you know, superficial critiques, I thought. I never quite understood them. Um, and then only lately, and especially lately, have I realized how important Leo Strauss is to me in understanding uh, the great texts and making sense of, of, of difficult and important ideas in the course of history. I see. Uh, I've come to the same conclusion. Uh, I was introduced to Strauss by the wonderful professor from Harvard, uh, Harvey Mansfield. Um, I actually got a chance wonderful. to talk to him um, two years ago, um, and I've been interested in both of their works since. And I, I discovered in Strauss a great deal of uh, knowledge of the the great thinkers of uh, mostly the Western world, as well as uh, how to read them in such a way that applies them, applies their thinking, I mean, to the present moment. Yes, and, and Harvey Mansfield is one of many students um, of Strauss who, whom I hold in, in high regard, really, and, and, and his students, uh, Far across the political spectrum, I've, I've found him deeply influential uh, on thinkers like Hannah Arendt, um, Susan Sontag, people who are multifaceted in their political orientation um, and don't necessarily hew to a conservative or liberal um, mm -hmm. ideology whatsoever. Um, he had a, a remarkable impact on me in understanding Jewish writers in particular, um, uh, the great, some of the greatest Jewish writers of all time who wrote um, like Maimonides under periods of, of persecution. And so he teaches us to look at the text in a way that forces us to understand that the author is almost always never explicit in the use of the well, in the intentions uh, that may that may breathe through the text you really have to look for subtleties often contradictions uh, reread the text many many times um to understand uh, what's being said and i think it was that gift that 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 impulse to understand the great thinkers of all time as being in, intensely hard to read that helped strauss resurrect uh, the importance of, of political philosophy and classical philosophy and, and the great thinkers. Um, and, and it's for that that I, I think he should be uh, uh, most admired. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, can't agree more. Now, um, regarding his politics, uh, um, I think Strauss's politics is pretty ambiguous, but nevertheless, the the common line of critique that people lob against him is that he uh, he's an sort of like a doyen figure of 
the American neoconservatives. So um, I think it's true that many uh, of those who are identified as American neoconservatives subscribe to the Straussian uh, way of reading text, or if not Strauss himself. Um, but I can think of many uh, Straussians who are explicitly not neoconservatives. So I wonder where is this connection? When is this connection formed? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's no doubt that many of the neoconservatives associated in particular with um, uh, the the Bush foreign policy um, moving into Iraq in the early 2000s, um, a lot of the people around Reagan who ascribed to um, a form of foreign policy that was rooted in, in virtue um, define themselves as new conservatives, no doubt. In my view, however, it's sort of a product and accident of history that Strauss is regarded as a conservative. Um, I, I see maybe two, three things having contributed to that association. The first is that his most famous student, Alan Bloom, um, and his extraordinary work at the closing of the American mind uh, was associated with the conservative and neoconservative movement. Um, but then I think the second accident of history is that conservatives far more than liberals have found themselves at the center of critiquing the ways in which modern academe, uh, academia um, has not emphasized uh, the, the great the great thinkers um and then and then yes and then and then with the rise of neoconservative foreign policy and the decision to move into iraq um it just so happened that many of those who describe themselves as neoconservatives attach themselves um to strauss now that you know at the same time there were many um critics of, of, of Bush's policies, you know, who were students of Strauss, um, uh, who, who sort of, um, you know, took, took different views. And so I th think a lot of our association with him has to do with uh, the way in which the foreign policy surrounding um, uh, the move in, in, into Iraq was was met with 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 derision um and scorn um and in so doing uh, the term straussian just became associated i think uh, dis disproportionately with neoconservative thinking i think neoconservative thinking goes far beyond strauss i think there's a lot more to neoconservatism than the kinds of ideas that strauss espoused <laughs> Nevertheless, does Strauss uh, has have like a philosophy regarding foreign policy? Well, he he was certainly never an imperialist at all. I mean, in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, he he um, if you looked at uh, his work on Plato and understanding Plato, that 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 became very clear. He did, of course. Um, you know, emphasize that there were that when one reads these great texts, there are immutable virtues and values that you can find transcendental, if you will. And so you can tease from that, you can tease from that, this idea that um, invoking virtue in foreign policy um, is is a Straussian ideal. But, you know, Strauss, above all else, was was a moderate. He 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 was someone who encouraged us to question um and uh so in that way he was neither a conservative and, and certainly not um its opposite so I, I i don't i don't see that in in strauss at all i i, I don't I, I don't see that i don't know if you do yeah um as far as i uh, as far as i've read from strauss i'm I haven't seen like a work that explicitly deals with foreign policy. I, I know of um, was it Natural Rights and History, his Walgreen lecture series, as yes. well as an essay that was compiled in um, the City and Man, um, and um, his uh, anthology of the history of political philosophy, which I've uh, consulted on a 
regular basis. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure if um he has any works uh, that is like explicitly uh deals with foreign policy. It's not like he's Hans Morgenthau or Kissinger and all that. No, I, I I agree with that interpretation. He he was, um, in in many ways he um he was a salve for contrarians. For he he taught us not only how to read the the great texts but also how to write. Um, you know, he talked about uh, exoteric writing, which I've been thinking about a lot, and and esoteric writing. Um, exoteric. Just meaning, you know, writing for the public that which you see is is what you you, you uh, what you have, and esoteric being his counsel, right? To to often conceal your ideas um, through metaphor. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what we read today on social media and in op eds, and I think if Strauss were with us today. Um, he died in 73, so uh, but about 50 years before um, the o October 7th attack. I, I feel he would he, he would see everything as exoteric. Um, everything, you know, you have to, when people on TV, in the op-ed pages, they're screaming a point of view that is hardly subtle. Um, and I often, I often wonder, um, what he'd think of that. Now, um, in reference to the title of your National Post piece, um, I assume that it was written and conceived uh, in the wake of the October the 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas. So I wonder, um, do you recall where you were at that time? Yes, I, I was at... I was at the campus of Cornell University um, in uh, Ithaca, New York. Um, it's a stunning campus, and it it it, it was Sukkot, um, the, the Jewish holiday, a joyous holiday. It comes sort of and and the Sabbath, so, so it falls five days after Yom Kippur, um, the Day of Atonement. But it, but but it was a holiday of joy, and I I remember strolling through Central Campus and seeing the the sukkahs, these sort of tent like celebratory infrastructures, um, and it it, it was a, a you know there, there was grief and confusion. Um, it's a heavily Jewish uh, campus, about twenty two percent of the student body, um, and and people were together, people were confused. Um, and I think being there at Cornell, where uh, there's a great deal of study of, of Jewish thought, made me think of um, made me think of Strauss. Um, although I think of him often, I would I, I think in periods of grief in my life, I I my first thought goes to um, really one, in my view, one of the top three greatest writers of all time being Anne Frank, the diarist, um, who died with her sister in Bergen-Belsen in the camps. And I, I, I was thinking about her work, her diary, and what, um, and what Leo Strauss might have said about that diary. Um, and I reflected on that. I, I've written a number of poems through the eyes of Anne Frank since October 7th. No, of course, Anne Frank was not a political writer. So uh, how would you make the connection between what happened to Anne Frank and, and what happened in October the 7th? So Anne Frank's diary is... Um, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, um, you know, t teenage texts read around the world. It's it's been translated in, into over seventy five languages. It's on the curriculum in in in, in countries ac across the world. Um, how it's read and how it's interpreted is very different than what was experienced 
by people like Anne, however. So, and, and, and I should confess to a personal connection to this story. My, um, my family relation, my cousin on my mother's side is Meyer Levin. And Meyer Levin was the, the famous American writer <laughs> who, uh, with his wife, Teresca Torres, promoted Anne Frank's uh, story to the world as a story of uniquely Jewish suffering. Um, so Anne Frank's story, as it's interpreted today and celebrated in, in generally speaking, in plays and in, in schools, is is a book of, of peace and a, and a book of unity universal suffering. And yet, if you read the book carefully, and, and it, it, it does definitely contain moments of joy, um, it, uh, but it also ends on a dark note of death. And I feel that um, I, I felt on rereading her diary, which I did after October 7th, I was forced to reckon with whether we as Jews, and I'm, I'm speaking as Jews, whether we as Jews, modern Jewry, have odorized the Anne Frank story of its unique, unique Jewish suffering. And so I, I was making that connection and I was sort of reading her diary with a Straussian orientation. So that's how I made the connection. I see. Well, um... I think uh, we're both concerned about what's going on in the realm of academia. And with the scandals regarding Harvard and other universities, um, it is um, it's fair to consider, like, why is this, why is it that uh, this particular environment becomes a hotbed of um, anti-Semitism as, uh, you know, um, in, in that anti-Semitism is accepted so long as espoused by people like Hamas, and also an inability to to condemn these forms of uh, bigotry. So I wonder if um, either Strauss or yourself uh, could provide some wisdom regarding this. Yeah, now Strauss, to the extent that I understand Strauss, he, you know, he was, he was very concerned with anti-Semitism and the importance of educating the Axis powers, you know, after the war uh, and all peoples about, about anti-Semitism. He was taken with Zionism, but he did, didn't have a simplistic uh, understanding of Zionism um, one, one way or the other. Um, it was, it was complex. Um, he did say, and I'll, I remember this very, I mean, he, he was very concerned that the Jewish diaspora would never be safe uh, outside of a of a Jewish state. Although he didn't feel that the Jewish state would necessarily solve the Jewish question. Um, now, in terms of um, a failure to condemn, I mean, the I've seen everything. I you know I I sort of have at least one toe, maybe more, in academia. And I do see, I do see, I do, I do see pe people um, uh, manifesting leadership. And leadership demands um, that you take clear moral positions. I was the CEO of a public company for 11 years. And when you're the CEO of a public company, you cannot be mealy-mouthed about important issues. Um, what I see in some of academia, because I say some, um, is a failure of authentic leadership. Um, the, I, I, I feel sometimes the structure of academia does not reward leadership. Um, it... it it, it has a variety of incentives that um, uh, reward different things, uh, but doesn't reward uh, people who uh, necessarily need to take a difficult um, positions um, and instead rewards activities that say, as a CEO would simply not be acceptable, right? The idea of just sort of being a, being a, a, a servant stakeholder and, and trying to be all things to all people. Um, 
how that's going to change in academia, I don't know. I think, you know, what I've said publicly is that um, what we see today is a great reveal. Um, it, you know, anti-Semitism has been with us for <clears throat> for thousands of years. There's many reasons postulated as to why none of which have, have been really um, proven um, to me as as being the answer. Um, but I, I I think that academia gets um, a lot of attention, uh, whereas we're seeing some of these same failures of, of, of leadership um, in other parts of our society as well. Um, we're seeing it in the corporate sector. Um, there have been, you know, I, I, I do know, you know, I, in the same, you know, people talk about social media, message boards and universities, but as, as being littered with hate, but we see the same thing. I hear it all the time on Slack message boards, people feeling bullied, um, and the inability to speak out. So I think this, the solution um, to anti-Semitism, to bullying, to, to all sorts of bad behavior is, uh, is leadership and nurturing, nurturing leaders um, and putting incentives in place to ensure that we have leaders in positions that matter and that we educate young people. And this is where Strauss is pertinent, where we educate young people about the importance of the great thinkers. One of the reasons that Strauss implores us to read the great thinkers, starting with Socrates and, and, and all the way through, is, is because it humbles us. It humbles us. Um, not all ideas are equal. Um, an idea that's come centuries later is not by definition superior to an idea that's come centuries prior. I do think that a greater appreciation of the greatest thinkers of all time, um, were that to be introduced more boldly within university curricula, would help. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what you think. I see. Um, so as you were giving your answer, I was thinking about the two um, 20th century German thinkers who were a huge influence on Strauss. Um, one is Martin Heidegger and the other is Carl Schmitt. Now, two of them were, I think you and I can both admit, were towering geniuses. They contributed a great deal to the history of philosophy and political philosophy, but they were also complicit in the Nazi regime. Now, Schmitt was way more than, than Heidegger. Um, and um, so I think the humility, one of the sources of humility from reading these great thinkers uh, can come from the fact that despite them being as great thinkers as they are, they are not immune, they are not immune from evil or bigotry or, or moral blindness. So I was thinking about that as I watch what's going on in the field of academia today, where some of the most intellectually gifted um, students as well as uh, faculty members um, while imitating the the propaganda line of uh, Hamas against Israel. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting. I'm, uh, you know, generally speaking, I, I'm of the view that those who have been um, sort of imitating the propaganda line um, of Hamas or sort of sea level scholars. Um, uh, but to your, you know, your earlier point about sort of people and their flaws. I mean, if you, I, I think this is, this is a really important point, right? Because what Strauss stood against was, you know, this historicism and this idea that, oh, my goodness, well, the the Stoics, the Greek Stoics, you know, they had slaves and ipso facto, we should disregard everything they say. Well, no, 
Um, I mean, the understanding of how to live a virtuous life, um, the understanding of what you owe to yourself and to your community and to, to the larger um the larger society this can really only be understood by reading people who who have flaws i mean you know the, 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 of course these 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 great thinkers had 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 flaws and so that's 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 interesting i i i mean i'm i'm only thinking of that for the first time now um as you say it but i i think i mean what what a sorry a sorry state you know the state of great thinkers and great books would be if we if we only had at our at our access um those who who were perfect and we of course we only know people to be perfect um because um their flaws had have yet to be um discovered now returning to Anne frank um uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the text by Daryl Horn. Uh, she's a Daryl Horn, of course. Yeah, American Jewish novelist. She wrote a book yes. recently. I think it was titled "Why Do People Love Dead Jews?" Um, yes. And and I read a piece in the Atlantic magazine uh, a few some months ago about like, how she was describing how Holocaust education has backfired in some ways because it. it uh, American or at least English speaking world's this centrality of the Anne Frank story um, have uh, tilted the focus away from the horrid killings and the horrid ideology of Nazi Germany and more to the suffering of um, people like Anne Frank. And Miss Horn, I believe, she says that they were taking away the the part, the fact that Anne Frank was Jewish, I think it was supposed to be read as a, at least from the like um, K to twelve reading, uh, a story about like how evil can, uh, can loom large, but still the good nature, uh, good nature of Anne Frank uh, prevails, but it it skirts away from the central fact that the Nazis killed Anne Frank because she was Jewish, and. Daryl Horn uh, concludes that to understand the Holocaust, you should understand what it means to be Jewish. At least this is what I read of her. I'm sure she can explain it better than um, than I. But nevertheless, um, so how do you propose that we should read the diary of Anne Frank as well as the life of Anne Frank? Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this Daryl Horn's thinking on this falls into a, a long rich history of of uh of of discussion and debate that included the greats meyer levin cynthia ozick and now daryl horn whom i i consider uh I, to be to be among the great greats of our time and thinking about this complex question i mean um you know there have been popular renditions of anne frank where there's no reference to the nazis um they're uh they're members of ICE, you know, under President Trump, mm -hmm. um, and 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 it there is just completely odorized of, of any uh, any Jewishness. Um, so um, yes, I mean, I I do believe that the the, the, the that the story as Cynthia Ozick and Daryl Horn and others and Meyer Levin have made clear. I mean, I I think that the story needs to be clear that it is a story of uniquely Jewish suffering because only then can we really try to better understand why Jews have been made scapegoats and suffered and under pogroms under, um, you know, in different centuries, different parts of the world. Um, so I think it forces us to examine that question only if it, it's, it, if it's um, done through that lens. The larger question though of, um, holocaust remembrance and whether it works i mean there's um and how how it can best be done and and when it should be infused i'm generally of the view that it should be infused at a younger age to the extent that it can be um there's debate over this um the, the danger with any of this is that it becomes performative um and that 
you know, it gets thrown into a curriculum where you you have a potpourri of of uh, of of subjects and and uh, it's a check the box uh, sort of thing. Um, but but what Dara Horn is referring to, I should say, is is a debate within the Jewish community itself. I mean, like to to what extent do we want and Frank to be accessible? to a large body of people, a large body of, of, of teenagers. Um, and, and that is an inherent debate. And I'm of the view that it's actually kind of healthy that that debate maybe never settles. I think it's a, it's a good debate, a good debate to have. Um, and I should say it was a debate within the Frank family itself, Otto Frank and his father, <laughs> of course, um, got in a, you know, famous litigation with, um, uh, with my family member Meyer Levin over the production of Anne Frank on Broadway, um, and this was, of course, uh, the 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 big debate uh, where Meyer Levin was forced to face off against the likes of Lillian, Lillian Hellman, um, and this is where, interestingly, in my own life, the neoconservatives came to the defense of my family, came to the defense of Meyer Levin. Um, so the editors of Commentary ma magazine, mm -hmm. um, which was then considered, of course, the the center of uh, of Jewish and neoconservatism, put forth the idea that uh, that Anne Frank was a quintessentially, essentially Jewish story and should be seen as as that. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, Commentary is just such a wonderful magazine. You know the the Bort Horaces and everyone. It's it's also provided a a great deal of uh, intellectual tonic in my day to day life. Yeah, I mean it, it. It for me, I mean, this is how I I discovered the great ideas, right? The commentary in the public interest, uh, <laughs> uh, the public interest, Irving Crystal's um, journal. I think he ended it about two thousand five. He passed away in two thousand nine, um, and this is where. I mean, and this is where, ne and, and this is what's quite interesting about neoconservatism, because neoconservatism, if you define it as that, as those public policies that were litigated under the auspices of commentary in the public interest, um, you know, this is where you find other features of neoconservatism that have nothing to do with Strauss. I mean, there, for example, the importance of leveraging data, um, the whole issue of the wisdom and, uh, and appropriateness of charter schools, for example, was litigated under under that. And um, and and so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it had a Jewish tinge because many of the thinkers who wrote in in, in those pages in the 80s, 70s, um, they were Jewish because they were they were formerly of the left. They and they were as Irving Kristol said, mugged by reality because they felt the Jews um, were not dealt a, a good hand by heavy state intervention. Um, and so they were compelled to look at public policy through the lens of um, uh, more of a laissez-faire state. And so we, we clearly, we share, we share a lot in common in terms of uh, our political upbringing or our ph philosophical upbringing. Yes, and I'm glad to hear it. Yes, I have here this... Uh... Oh, that that's a great that's a great book. I read it yes. a long time ago. Wonderful essay called yeah. Neoconservatism, the autobiography of an, an idea by Aubrey Crystal. I'm it, it, yes, it, I, these were and it was of a time. Mm -hmm. It was of a time. I mean I no 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 disrespect to John Butterettes and the, the current the <laughs> current editors of these journals, but but it was of a time, you know, that it, we could we I don't know if you follow even the, the intelligent design debate, mm -hmm. the IQ wars. Um, these were all these were all litigated in those journals, um, and uh, and they they they, were, they just didn't find a home elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, right. I, I suppose uh, another another point, uh, and I suppose I could bring back both Anne Frank and Daryl Horn into this, is that. Um, the idea of um centralizing the Holocaust as part of the as part of uh, studying and educating uh, people about anti-Semitism can also be quite misleading. Um, 
And yes. one, because of the magnitude of the Holocaust um, that can divert people's attention away from other horrific, but um, I guess lesser known in terms of scale and casualty uh, that is perpetuated by anti-Semitism. Um, I recently finished um, a book by Bernard Malamud, The Fixer. Um, oh, it was a great novel. Oh, he, what a wonderful book and writer. Yeah. It is. And it's um, is similar to Kafka's as, uh, The Trial, only this time he places it in a very particular context, a Jewish man living in Tsarist Russia in the, I suppose, turn of the 19th to 20th century. And he was um, arrested for the the classic um, Jewish slander, um, the blood libel. And and I think uh, it is a novel that I think if you if you only have like a vague idea of what anti-Semitism is, you might come up with a much more vivid idea of anti-Semitism, like if you reach uh, the end of it. Um, so and also it revealed that um, the the potential, at least the per perpetuity of anti-Semitism, which is across cultures, is not just something that was invented in Germany. It was uh, it existed in Russia and now it is, um, I suppose, thriving in certain parts of the Arab world. So, of course, um, according to Leo Strauss, and this is my question, if I sorry for getting so long winded, how would Strauss understand anti-Semitism? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, it, I, I don't know if he would understand it any better than we understand it today, except to suggest that it was a, it was, it, it he, he was of the view that it, it was enduring and that, um, the, and during his, you know, his Zionist period, I mean, he, he was a Zionist from early days in his under, in his definition of Zionism, um, he, he would feel that anti-Semitism was enduring and so much so that uh, Jews would um, would suffer in the diaspora. Um, so I, I, I can't I can't I can't answer it further from Leo Strauss's perspective. What I can say, however, building on Bernard Malamud, and 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 I and perhaps Strauss might say this too, is that in my view, the greatest, um, the the greatest investigators of of anti semitism, its scourge, its perniciousness, um, its transcendence, are fiction writers, and many of them are fairly recent too. Like, um, Dara Horn is one, but there's others. I mean, Nathan Englander, um, who wrote. Perhaps one of the best long short stories ever written. Um, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank is an excellent investigation of the deep, deep complexities um, at um and complex dynamics um of anti-semitism even within the jewish community and so i i think that leo strauss would be a big a big fan of of, of nathan englander you spoke of bernard malib but there's also howard jacobson's um wonderful book the finkler question which of course is code for you know the jewish question and he has this ability to combine humor um with a study of, of anti-semitism which is a gift of extraordinary power of course um i'm biased but meyer levin and my own family with his books um explored uh anti-semitism and so i i wonder if it can be explored in that regard, I think we're at an early period in very early in understanding the why, the wherefore, and where to of anti Semitism. You know, there's been a lot of interesting um, 
you know, analyses of anti-Semitism in times of economic malaise as an early indicator, um, Jews being a scapegoat. This has always been um, always been a phenomenon. Um, I would be interested in learning um, from, you know, evolutionary biologists um, to, to understand whether or not a Jew as scapegoat is a, is, is sort of a protective Darwinian phenomenon that we, that society keeps reinventing because it, 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 it's too omnipresent a phenomenon that crosses cultures and traditions um, and timelines that it really needs to be understood scientifically. Um, and so I, I think what's been going on the last few months during what I call the great reveal, which is simply a recognition that it's, it's much deeper and much more widespread uh, than we imagined is um, an invitation and for for people, for scholars from diverse fields to investigate um, uh, why anti-Semitism um, persists. Mm -hmm. So as we are talking right now, I'm I heard the news that um, South Africa is uh, dragging Israel into the International Criminal Court. Yes. Uh, the charges, yes. of course, genocide against the Palestinians. Um, now. I think it reveals um, two things for me. One is that um, the, I guess, the international uh, Judenhaas, hatred of the Jews, has been transposed from, say, individual Jews or certain Jewish families like the Rothschilds to the majority Jewish state, Israel. And two, um, there's, there's always an attempt to sort of decouple Zionism, the idea that the Jewish people should have a state, and Judaism, uh, the idea that you know there's a there's this millennia long Jewish culture, and there's this piece I read in uh, Olet about the Soviet efforts to try and um, tarnish the idea of Zionism, claiming that it is not Jewish and whatnot. So, I guess my question now to you is, um, to what extent is Zionism, like a a part of um, Jewish history and culture. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Zionism um, is essential for uh, the Jewish people to exist, and this was a, a, a widely recognized view um, uh, after the war um, to suggest um, that. You know, to, to to suggest that one is only anti-Zionist and not anti-Jew is to implicitly or explicitly be calling for the forcible displacement or worse of more than fifty percent of the world's Jews um, to go, God knows where, to parts of um, Europe. Um, the events taking place at the ICJ um are orwellian um the um you know to it, it was rafael lemkin who with a polish holocaust survivor he defined he coined the term genocide in 1944 and to be leveraging it against israel in this way is 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 a libel um and one can only come to this sort of conclusion if one goes through the greatest mental contortions imaginable um, that might include things like the idea, the non-fact that um, Jews never existed in the land. So it, it, it forces a, a sort of a, a a really um, disturbing re rethinking of, of the facts. Um, one can be opposed to, um, you know, Israeli policies, undoubtedly, and that is certainly not anti-Semitic, as, as we know. Within Israel, there's a great deal of um, opposition um, to 
Israeli policies, a healthy opposition. Um, but the you know the last few months have shown very clearly that anti-Zionism is in fact anti-Semitism, or certainly the burden of proof, the overwhelming burden of proof is on those who claim otherwise to prove um, to prove the opposite. Um, so, uh, but 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 what ha what's happening? Uh, yes, at the Hague is is particularly um, upsetting. I, I think that um, Israel is and should be taking it very seriously um, because uh, it has the um, you know the, the, these claims and counterclaims have the power uh, to affect narrative very very powerfully. I suppose the effort to dis defend Israel, um, I think there is twofold, so to speak. There's the military defense, that is, as in what the IDF is doing right now, and also the effort to defend Israel in the information war. I understand that um, uh, after, say, 1973, uh, when uh, the Arab armies, as well as their supporters, um, realize that they cannot defeat Israel militarily, they move on to the next battlefield, which is um, uh, legally or information-wise. Um, it starts with uh, the UN uh, uh, promoting a resolution uh, equating Zionism with, with racism. I think that has um, continued since. Um, it's um, perhaps not so surprising that South Africa is bringing this matter up to court because um, for decades now, um, the treatment of Israel uh, of it, of Israel to its uh, Arab citizens is likened to what the old regime of South Africa treated its uh, black citizens, a charge that I think crumbled under the facts. But nevertheless, these, these charges carry a form of potency and for those who are ignorant of what's going on uh, historically between Israel and its Arab neighbors, it can be all too convincing. So in terms of the information warfare, what are we to do? Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. And I don't, I don't think the answer is 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 simply um uh one of one of response um lately you know just just responding with, of, of course that's important to respond with facts and to um to explain the difference to explain the, the rights that all arab israelis have that are equal um the two israeli citizens uh, but but that those are those are things that are done I mean, I think we need to speak with one another. I've been in good discussions recently with Hillel's across, um, you know, North America, and the importance of multi-faith dialogue. This is really important. Um, we, when we don't, it, it's very easy to, um, it's very easy to create cartoonish and to believe and fall under the trap. And Strauss talked about this, especially when the state endorses it or the state doesn't deny it forcefully um, to, to fall into these traps of misinformation. Um, when when you don't know people on, on a personal level, I, I do think it's important um, <clears throat> that that be done. So the Hillel's, uh, there's a lot of work done where Hillel's have Friday night dinners and, and, and conversations with people from um interfaith conversations and there's a lot going on within the muslim community on this same topic as well i i think it i think that's a big part of the solution um the um un itself um is uh is suffering a bit of a branding um problem uh, right now, and and it, it it and if they don't know it, they're going to learn it quickly as it becomes uh, inevitably a, a 
topic uh, of conversation in, in, in this very important American election. Um, and I think to get ahead of this game, I think the United Nations is going to have to force itself um, to reckon with uh, the very serious charges that have been made against it um, in not having taken, not having, you know, not having certain taken the events of October 7th uh, with with the gravity that 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 they should not having spoken early enough, especially on the matter of of uh, systematic rape and systematic uh, sexual assault, uh, deeply disturbing and, and frankly shocking. Um, the uh, uh, the lack of action there. So I I think that there's um, a piece of this that involves conventional multi ethnic conversation, multi faith dialogue. Um, that's that's not sophisticated. That's not online sort of narrative. Uh, and then there's a piece of this that is also um, the United Nations uh, um, reforming from within. Um, and and may, maybe that's not possible. I don't know. But I, I do think it's um, it's a very important uh, discussion and it's a discussion that's going to be made for the United Nations if they don't make it themselves and so far as uh, the Americans are, are, are taking this very seriously and it, both on the Democratic and Republican side um, in the next uh, in the next 11 months. So do you suppose that there um, there will be a reckoning um, when and if uh, the the um... The conflict ends, or at least this chapter of the conflict between Israel and Hamas ends, uh, regarding how uh, many of uh, the most esteemed organizations, as well as people, um, they're either silent uh, in their condemnation of Hamas or are complicit in what Hamas is doing. I think there's going to be a number of, I mean, and, and history teaches us this uh, this happens all the time i think there's going to be a number of, of leading figures i hope that will come forward expressing regret um at at not not having spoken up forcefully earlier early earlier enough i you know i i i don't know really um a lot of it depends on um on how long the conflict lasts um of course the the priority is getting the hostages home and pressing Hamas to do as much as it can to end this war. And Hamas has the the ability to do that. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I, I I don't know how long this is a military question. Um, I, I did not, you know, I did not foresee this war I, i'm just speaking about the acute phase of the war i did not see the acute phase of the war going on as long as it is it as it has um, i was naive um uh, and it also of course depends on whether or not it expands um uh, beyond uh, the immediate belligerence so um yeah i you know i don't know um but i do believe uh that if history is our um, temple here, our guide, there will be a number of, of leaders who will re regret not, say, having taken um, the moral clarity that, uh, that Germany, for example, has taken and continues to take with respect to uh, both what's happening at the uh, ICJ and the, at the Hague um, and, uh, and earlier. Um, it's going to manifest itself in the Canadian election. I mean, we already see here in in Canada, um, you know, there, there's by-elections forthcoming, and candidates in these by-elections are talking about about moral clarity uh, um, in, in war as being an important topic. Um, so, so we're going to see it, I think, manifest in many elections uh, over over the next year. Um, yeah. Now, I think this should be a good note to end on. So. I think from your reading of Strauss, um, what is the role of morality in politics? The first 
lesson that Strauss teaches us is as a political actor, um, you um, you are involved in the decision making as as a and you are a moral being, and as such, um, you have an obligation to um, to act to act more. Um, so politics is an is is inherently um, an activity that um, requires us to have in our leaders an understanding of virtue. Um, that virtue is, in my view, easier um, to establish if you you know if you as Strauss recommends if you've read the great works if you have an anchor in history if you have an understanding of history, um, if you have an understanding that, uh, um, that that not all ideas are equal. Yes, Strauss preaches that morality is essential to the act of being political, to being a political actor. Um, it is easier to be um, a, a person of moral conviction and moral clarity if one's read the great books. And secondly, that if one recognizes that not all ideas are equal or relativistic and that some ideas in history, um, uh, including uh, liberty um, and autonomy, are to be um, prioritized uh, ahead of others. Um, and that you have to make tough decisions as a leader. You have to lead with conviction and authenticity. Um, and and this is really the black swan, I think, that we've seen in the last several years, is that we, in many of um, the G20 nations, we haven't seen um, authentic leadership uh, uh, leading in a way uh, that is not just consistent, but, but clear and um, may let some people down um, but also um, is clear-eyed about what what you stand for. <laughs> so to be a great political leader, you have to be a great moral leader as well, I suppose. Yeah, they're they're twinned. Uh, they're not separable. Um, and uh, of course, this is at odds with what we <laughs> what 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 we're familiar with when when we think of many of our leaders. Um, but we have had we 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 have had leaders in in Canada and elsewhere that that take this concept seriously. Um, it, it's just that we, you know, performative politics just because it works well on social media, it doesn't have a ha much of a half life in, in real life. People have uh, awakened um, to the need for our leaders to have integrity. Um, we're going to see that, I think, um, in the French election, the U.S. election, and the Canadian election, and many of the impactful elections uh, that we see before us in the next year or so. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Neil Seaman, for joining the show. Thank you, Sean.